back after lunch. My name is Bernard Leduc. I'm uh, president and CEO of Hôpital Montfort in Ottawa. Now, usually, uh, because being from Ottawa, I would start with a hockey joke, but because we're pressed for time, I'll keep that for an extra an another time. So, our um, topic of discussion this afternoon is building on strong foundations, leveraging Ontario's assets. And we've listened this morning with you know, great interest about uh, some international perspective about patient engagement. We had patients actually discussing patient engagements, health leaders discussing patient engagement. Uh, we had the uh, good pleasure of looking at uh, the interesting projects that will be uh, part of the uh, initial OSU impact projects with uh, great delight and congratulations to all the uh, the recipient of the awards. Um, and now what's a little bit particular with the uh, support unit in Ontario is actually how we are leveraging centers of excellence that we, uh, we have in the province. And uh, so the topic discussion and our panelists, I'll introduce uh, their name. I'll ask them when they start speaking to actually talk a little bit about their organization, their role, and how they see they fit into the big picture of uh, uh, patient-oriented uh, research. So, um, and we'll, I've got some questions that are ready, but we'll get you involved uh, from the, the room if you have questions uh, with the panel discussion. I will try to get the schedule back on track, so I'll make sure that uh, each panelist don't uh, go further than the three, three and a half minutes that's been allocated to them. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. John Lavis, Lavis? Lavis? Lavis, Professor, Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster University. After that, we've got Susan Marlin, who's going to be uh, talking. She's president of C CEO of uh, Clinical Trial Ontario. Uh, Dr. Martin Osman, CEO and Scientific Director of the uh, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute. And Dr. Michael Schull. President, CEO, and senior scientist of the Institute of Clinical Evaluation Sciences, and Monica Talliard, senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Mavis. Super. Thank you very much. So I, I guess our center is, isn't so much a center as a collaboration among a group of health economics and policy analysis experts on the one hand at the Center for Health Economics and Policy Analysis, and then a bunch of us who are kind of impacts obsessed, trying to figure out how to achieve impacts on the health system at the McMaster Health Forum. And there's many lenses that you could bring to bear on what we bring to the table, but I, I'm just going to highlight one, which is less focused on conducting uh, patient-oriented research and more on supporting the use of patient-oriented research to drive changes in the system. So we're going to have all this fantastic stuff that comes out of the impact studies, uh, out of SPORE more generally. How do we actually make sure that it drives change in the system? So there's two ways that we're particularly focused on. One is putting patient-oriented research studies in the context of the full range of evidence that's needed to drive change in systems. So we know for, to drive change, you need to convince people there's a problem with understandable causes. We need to know not just the benefits and harms of interventions like many of the impact studies are going to get us, but we also need to know patients' values and preferences about those interventions. We need to know how to bring about change on the implementation side, and you heard Noah talk about that. And we can do that because we now sit on one-stop shops like Health Systems Evidence that have all the systematic reviews in the world about how to drive change in systems and how to actually bring about change at the practice level. We can do it because we run a rapid response unit. So if your stakeholders that you're working with don't know the evidence that on a topic that uh, an issue that was raised because of your research, within 3, 10, and 30 business days, we can pull together the best available evidence in the world on that topic. We can also prepare citizen briefs that put that study in the context of everything else that's known on a topic so that citizens can have an informed discussion about how they think the system needs to evolve. And we can do the same thing as an evidence brief to inform a stakeholder dialogue where you bring together the key players, the assistant deputy ministers, the CEOs of LENS, the heads of professional associations, the head of patient groups, and so on. So that's one way that we do it. Second way that we do it is we try to systematically elicit the values and preferences needed to drive improvements in the system. And we do that both by doing systematic reviews of studies that have looked at patients' values and preferences, 
because we care about benefits and harms, as many of these trials are going to help us understand, but we also care about all of the evidence that's been collected over time about patients' values and preferences. And we can also engage them through citizen panels, where we bring together ethnoculturally, socioeconomically diverse groups of patients, supported by the best evidence, to think through what should be driving the system. And we can do the th same thing with stakeholder dialogue. So we're partners with a number of you both on your impact grants, planning to help to put your research results in the context of what else is going to be needed to drive change in the system. And we're going to be working with you to convene citizen panels and stakeholder dialogues once we know the results to figure out how we're going to drive change. I'll just say one other quick thing. We all sit on many working groups in addition to our core work. The one that uh, Moira uh, Stewart leads is about capacity to find and use patient-oriented research. And we're going to have a lot of very useful stuff that's available coming out of that so you can work with patients and other stakeholders to help them be better users of patient-oriented research. Thank you. So, uh, Clinical Trials Ontario, our organization is not doing research, but what we're focused on is trying to improve the environment for doing clinical trials in Ontario. Ontario. So there are three areas that we focus in. The first is in terms of streamlining processes for conducting clinical trials. And our flagship or our first priority there has been to work on streamlining the research ethics review process in Ontario. So you heard a few people this morning um, uh, reference Clinical Trials Ontario and helping with the ethics review. So what we've done is set up a system whereby one ethics board in the province can review and approve a multi-site research project to clinical trial or other health research for multiple sites across the province. Oh, it's the Oprah thing. Yes. <laughs> I was just telling my friend here that I had a good friend on Oprah a while ago and she had on pearls and they were jiggling and making noise and I did the same thing, although I'm not on Oprah, of course. But anyway, so... <laughs> It's like Oprah, it feels like it. Um, anyway, so we're, that, that is our flagship program, and we we're really thrilled to launch that in March this year. And we're really thrilled to be working with, with the OSU studies because they are providing a great opportunity to get a lot of our institutions really engaged in going in terms of using this streamlined process. It's a lot of work for our institutions to get up and going. Uh, but, but when they see a good reason to do so, such as the OSU studies, they're doing so. So that's one area that we're working in. Another area for CTO is really about supporting participation in research by engaging patients and the public. And this was meant to be a later stage goal for CTO, but it's time for that now. So this initiative and what's happening here is really quite perfect for us. I mean, in some ways we think by their very nature, clinical trials, that is patient-oriented research. You have patients and you have interventions and treatments um, that are meant to impact the patient. Um, however, we feel there is a significant opportunity really to orient patients and the public better to clinical trials and clinical research, so to ensure that they're more aware of research, and also to better orient the trials to the actual patients. So as we move forward into the second phase of CTO, patient public engagement will be one of our higher priorities and trying to work with our stakeholders and research community to try and ensure the research and the trials that we do is it's just a better fit for the patients that are, that are actually part of that that research Great. hi so I'm, I'm Martin Osmond and I, I am the CEO of the research Institute at CHEO but here I'm I'm the uh, co-chair of the Ontario Child Health Sports Support Unit, along with uh, Colin MacArthur, who's sitting at the back from, from Sick Kids. And uh, I just want to start by saying a big congratulations to Vasanthi and to the OSSU for putting this together. I really think it's impressive to have this gathering of, of patients and providers, uh, researchers, government, industry, all together for this one aim, and I, I'm, I'm really interested to see what it's going to be like next year, the year after, the year after that, when we all have these stories together, collective stories, of how um, this important patient engagement has moved us forward. The Ontario uh, Child Health Support Support Unit is really building on existing strengths uh, in methodologic support and data support that exists in uh, both uh, Sick Kids and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. 
Uh, it's a provincial resource and, and uh, it's focusing on health system priorities in uh, child and youth in Ontario. Um, what we've chosen to do is at SickKids to build a, a clinical trials unit. So there, there's expertise in uh, methodological support, in uh, health economics uh, support, regulatory advice, logistics, um, design and quality of pediatric trials as areas of study, but also as areas of um, helping support trials that you've heard, some of which you've heard about being funded through the impact awards. And at CHEO, there's a development of a data hub. So working with uh, ISIS, um, having an individual in, embedded in ISIS, also looking at um, creating child health uh, data registries where we can federate data sets uh, of child health information that resource, researchers can then use uh, to answer important questions in the, in the province. Also at GEO is the BORN database, Better, better Outcomes Research Network and Registry for uh, all uh, live births in uh, Ontario it is stored in this database. So another rich resource for researchers to use. So bringing together sick kids and, and CHEO and methodologic support is what the Ontario Child Health Sports Support Unit is about. And then using that to reach out uh, throughout the province. So networking with the other pediatric academic centers we have with, uh, with McMaster, with London, with Queens, and then into the north and to Blurview, another important uh, center in, in Toronto in uh, pediatric health care. So we've networked with the, the five pediatric centers, and what we want to be is really the magnet to attract researchers to work through to get their projects done. Uh, another platform of what we've done is capacity building, because uh, to increase the expertise in, in uh, child health research is what our, our group is about. And so we've partnered with the uh, Canadian Child Health Clinical Science Program, Scientist Program, which is all about the CCHCSP, which is a CIHR funded training program all about um, training the researchers of tomorrow and developing a child health curriculum uh, towards real world trials and comparative effectiveness research to be done as a module within that group. Uh, and lastly, demonstration projects. So some projects that we've helped um, fund uh, to work on uh, five different uh, areas throughout the province including concussion, uh, transition in care, which is an incredibly important uh, area in pediatrics, moving from adolescent to uh, the adult system. Um, complex care, which subtend a lot of resources for, for child health, and uh, through primary care networks. So that's a, that's a basic description of, of the uh, Child Health Support Support Unit. ISIS, the Institute for Clinical Value of Sciences, and um, uh, you know we're here talking about leveraging Ontario's assets and how OSU has, is enabling that and, and the sport initiative more broadly. Um, so ISIS is a great example. So we are a, an independent, not-for-profit research institute. We've been around for about 25 years now, um, and uh, for, for most of those years, we've been, you know, we've had remarkable access to Ontario Health Administrative data, which is supplemented by all sorts of other data sets that our researchers uh, gather and link. Um, but really, we've served primarily the interests of the researchers that are part of the Institute. That's kind of been what we do. That's what we were funded to do, uh, and so that's what we did. And traditionally, a criticism of, of the organization was that it was very difficult for folks from outside of the Institute to get access to that data. And that was true. And it was true not necessarily because we didn't want to share, but rather because it wasn't, we weren't funded to do that. It was something that you, we, we would do sort of on the corner of our desks when we had some time, if we could find a researcher who would be willing to partner with an external researcher and so on. So there is no doubt that, um, that uh, the SPORE initiative has been transformative for, for ISIS. I don't think it's an exaggeration to use that word. Um, because uh, in the first instance, back in 2013, when uh, we went through a strategy review uh, um, and SPORE was sort of in the offing, it hadn't yet been landed, uh, but we went through a, a, a very comprehensive strategy review as, as an institute, and we decided um, uh, very clearly that one of our key goals was to build on our research excellence, ex uh, um, d deepen and broaden our impact by uh, leveraging uh, our data, and one of the key ways to do that is to broaden access to that data. 
So with the resources that came to us through SPOR from the Ontario government, from CIHR, uh, we built a platform which we call Data and Analytics Services, which now allows uh, researchers uh, access to data, to linked de-identified data that they can use for research, uh, for, for their research studies uh, on their terms. Essentially, we have dedicated staff, we have dedicated uh, hardware and, and processes uh, so that we can provide very good service to researchers from, uh, from not just across Ontario, but now across Canada to have access to that data. Um, we've had more than 160 requests already in just over about a year, and approximately about 130 of them uh, we determined to be feasible. Uh, in other words, sometimes a question can't really be answered with the data we have, and there's a dialogue that goes on between the researcher and our staff. Uh, but we're now proceeding at various stages of completion uh, on about 130 of those projects. And so that's extremely exciting because it really does open up a whole new opportunity to, to leverage the, the data resources that, that we have at the Institute for the benefit, really, of, uh, of uh, researchers across Canada. And it's not just researchers, because also knowledge users, health system stakeholders, can also access this data. And I think that's extremely important. We've also begun a, uh, uh, um, uh, the linkage of external trial data to our data, or cohorts from outside of, of ISIS, uh, bringing that into, uh, onto our servers, linking it with our data, so that for a randomized trial, for example, you can now follow patients for two years, five years, 10, 15 years, using health administrative data. You can look at overall health system utilization. And in, in partnership uh, or, or you know, collaborating with CTO, I think it provides this remarkable environment for clinical trials where you can take advantage of what CTO is doing and also take advantage of the data availability at ISIS. Um, on a personal level, this has also led to many new collaborations. So for example, I'm involved in a project where we're collaborating with the, the Montfort Hospital, uh, as well as Patients Canada. And I can tell you that this would not have come about if it weren't for, for SPOR. So you know, I can see this as an institute administrator. I can also see it as a, as a researcher, how this, is, uh, how this really has been transformative. Um, I would just sort of say two things uh, in conclusion. One is this process is still very young. There is still a lot to be done, and I think uh, this morning we've been talking a lot about patient engagement, patient involvement. We heard Simon, we heard Susan talking about that, and you know I think the reality is we're really taking baby steps. I'm speaking about ISIS. Um, many other groups here are probably far much further advanced. We really need to learn more about how to do that well, and that's something that we recognize that we're, 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 we haven't figured that out yet. The second thing is, as I think we begin to use the data that we, uh, that we have access to more, and there are, there are more demands on that data, we're going to understand where the gaps are. And we know where some of those gaps are already. For example, electronic medical records. So we are, uh, through the work of Rick Bertwistle at Queens and Karen Tu uh, at ISIS and U of T, we already have about 800,000 or so patient electronic medical records linked to uh, uh, our databases. That's, that's really too small to conduct population-based research in Ontario. That needs to be expanded, and that's something that we're going to uh, um, work towards uh, with, with partners. But that is a gap that we need to, to solve, um, and because that will be provide an, an enormously um, valuable platform for research. And then the second thing is when we, you know, thinking again about what we were talking about this morning, what outcomes are important to patients, well, we don't have great data on activities of daily living. We don't have great data on whether Mrs. Smith can garden again after her, her knee replacement and so on. And those are things that we know are important to patients. So where is that data going to come from? I think these are challenges that we're going to be having to uh, deal with over the next few years. Um, but I think they're terrific challenges to have, and I'm very excited to, uh, to work hard at them. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm um, standing in for Dean Ferguson, who uh, couldn't be here today. Um, I'm a methodologist within the Ottawa Methods Centre, which, um, as you know, is the designated uh, methods service provider to the um, OSU collaboration. And so our overarching goal is to enable and to enhance uh, patient-oriented uh, research. So how do we do that? Well, three main ways. First of all, we do it by offering uh, methodological consultation and support to SPOR-related projects across Ontario. And um, these consultations are usually done by dedicated um, PhD methodologists and um, clinician scientists who are willing and able to give of their time to support a project, um, a proposed project, from the concept stage through the design, implementation, and uh, knowledge translation stage. And so fortunately, uh, well, this requires a broad range of expertise, as you know. 
um, and we are fortunate to have that within our center. So we have uh, scientists who specialize in uh, research methodology and study design, uh, data management, um, knowledge synthesis, uh, statistical analysis, health economic analysis, uh, health technology assessment, and also um, knowledge translation. So uh, in addition to all of this uh, expertise, which we've had available at our center, and, and many other centers have that too, um, we are also increasing in our ability to offer advice and support with respect to how to engage patients in research. And so the second way in which we do this is to conduct methodological research. So um, this usually uh, uh, comes from, um, or we do this by implementing and developing new uh, methodologies that arise from challenges that we encounter in our research projects. And also out of necessity, perhaps uh, more recently, uh, figuring out exactly how we should engage uh, patients in research and what are the best methods to do that. Um, and then thirdly, it's through um, uh, capacity building through mentoring and training the next generation of um, researchers in Ontario. Thank you. So I guess if uh, we're going to open questions from the floor, but uh, just to get the ball rolling, um, most of your organization and some new collaboration have happened actually with you know the uh, children. Uh, initiative with sick kids and CHEO, but most and CTO is quite new. But most of the organization, you know, have a history of that. So, how is that transformational in terms of looking at business, not as usual, but changing? We all say that it's a, a new journey, and we're taking baby steps. But how do you find that you've had to either change, or what do you expect you'll need to change in the future to actually accommodate and and work towards that uh, patient engagement research? Yeah. Uh, so, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is an area in which uh, CTO is just really starting to engage in in earnest. So um, one of the things that we intend to do, for example, is to uh, have patients of the public directly involved in, lead in the leadership of CTO. So one of, the, one of the things we'll be doing in the near future is adding a, a, a patient representative to our board of directors. But the other thing we'd like to do is really engage patients and or the public, especially when we're talking about the trial. Sometimes it's healthy people and sometimes it's actually patients. So I use those terms sort of interchangeably. But we want to involve them in our programming. I really appreciate it, uh, Leslie Thompson's word today, words today about you know KGH making that decision that everything that they did that could impact a patient, they would have patient engagement in making decisions around that issue. So we'd like to look at that doing, to, doing that too. There are some things we can do internally in that regard in CTOs, so whether it be developing a sample consent form for clinical trials, having patient or public engagement in that, that's one area. But we'd also like to look at more systematic programs that we might be able to support and offer out there. For example, we do a lot of clinical trials with industry sponsors. We often hear our sponsors say things like, we are starting to have patients involved in developing our protocols and our consent forms and, and weighing in on whether or not there are too many tests and too many visits and these sorts of things. So we'd like to encourage in a more programmatic way resources to help not just industry sponsors, but investigator-initiated trials as well to actually really fully incorporate the patient or the public voice into the study design. I think what's been uh, transformational for us has really been um, getting people together in the province who have a similar aim and a similar goal and uniting the strengths that are already there. So, I, I mean, I touched on that a little bit, but at, at SickKids, for example, uh, there's a, Dr. Martin Offringa who works on, on um, defining what are the, the, the standards for pediatric clinical trials and how these should be, uh, should be best done. Now we can roll that out throughout the entire network, and that can be done across the province. We at CHEO have expertise in using REDCap, um, uh, which is a basically database management, data management uh, web-based program for, for trials research, which we can use now to support others across the province. So it's really, it's really linking, it's leveraging our, our advantages, and uh, 
in our, the first meetings that we've had together, actually, when we've, when we've brought um, many of our methodologists and statisticians and data people together, was an exciting time where they could see that there are other individuals across the province working towards the same goals, and that's really uh, been galvanizing. So I mean, one example that, that I'll give, uh, and uh, another example of a, new, a partnership that's been significantly strengthened, I would say, by virtue of SPORE is um, uh, our partnership with the Chiefs of Ontario, uh, and it was alluded to in, in Michael Green's presentation, the Impact Award. Um, and, you know, this is something that, that uh, we've been able to, to um, better define as a priority for our institute, uh, is to address uh, the health challenges in First Nations communities. And I think what's really exciting about it is in working with uh, Carmen, where she, she's over here, so she's gone, stepped out. Um, but in working with the Chiefs of Ontario and in the communities that they represent, we now have received several requests from those communities, from health providers in Aboriginal communities saying, help us understand patterns of disease in our community. And so we are crunching the numbers and producing that report back. This is not for publication. This is not to go to government. This is to go right to the community and to community providers and, and the people uh, to help them better manage health in their communities. I find that remarkably exciting and a very different kind of partnership for, uh, or a very different kind of product for a health institute, certainly, in, in, in my experience. I guess uh, it feels to me like what's different is twofold. One is the first time that there's been a, a clear articulation that what we're trying to achieve with research is tangible impacts on the system and in the care that patients receive that matter to them. So it feels like for a change, we know which direction we need to row. And the second thing is it's the first time that the incentives have been in place to force us to row in the same direction, to actually collaborate. So none of our centers alone are going to provide the full array of, of answers to questions that matter. But when you force people to work across their institutional boundaries, I think then you get the teams that are going to provide that much richer understanding. So for me, it's both being clear about what shore we're rowing towards, but also the fact that for a change, all of the players in Ontario are trying to row in the same direction using research as one way to get there. Alyssa. Thank you. Um, so my big question is, I'm hearing, and I'm grateful to hear, that there are a lot of different organizations and institutions that are engaging uh, patients in various aspects of research and so on. But I'm worried that there's going to be a duplication of effort, and how, um, how do you see this coming together systematically so that we have ongoing uh, sustainable operational funding to support patient engagement? and there is a centralization at least of the knowledge of who's engaged, where the opportunities are, uh, what kind of training might be available or orientation and so on. I would be welcoming of any comments people have to that because I think that's something that we sorely need to take this to the next level. I guess two quick reactions. One would be on the research front. I think SPORE now has these working groups that are trying to deal with cross-cutting issues. One of them would be in the area of capacity. So there's so much disparate effort out there to try and figure out what are the types of capacities that patients and those working with them feel they need and then how can we best need them. And we have all of these things going on, but that group is trying to figure out how do you knit that into a collective whole that's very efficient and does, has, achieves the maximum impact with the limited resources. So I think the working groups are trying to figure out what are the things that are going well out there, how do we knit them together, how do we address the gaps, and how do we become most, much more efficient. So I think SPORE is trying to get those conversations up and running. And I guess the second part of the conversation is I care about this not just because of the research, but also because of using research evidence. And I think we also need to be much better at making sure this stuff's available in language that people understand in one place. So to give you another example of, of work that we're doing, McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, all the products that are specifically designed for patients in one place. And one of the, the types of resources that are there are uh, web resource ratings. So all of those free online resources available for patients, you can quickly search the database and find the ones that are based on high quality research evidence. So I think your question applies not just on the research side, but also on the research use side. How do we set this up in a way that's efficient and sustainable? So I think it's a great question and one that we're at least having the conversations to start to move towards. So I think 
it's great that we have the working groups. What I'm, what I'm hoping for is that at some point we will have some kind of either entity or yep. place where we have sustainable funding, a staff, and whatever it takes to support all of that. Okay. Yep. Point taken. Um, yep. Okay. Good. Frank. Um, I'm interested in the, um, the, the way in which we're, we're thinking about the patient and public, and almost go back to the question David asked this morning, and Susan mentioned it as well. You know, I think to make an absolute distinction between them is, uh, is false because patients always are part of the public. They don't, they don't cease being public citizens when they become patients and almost all citizens are at least eventually patients. But I guess the question here comes in, a, a term we haven't heard today and that is opportunity cost. Um, and somebody mentioned about health, econ health economics. And then the question is about involving patients and the public you know, um, in discussions or, uh, that related to, you know, that we, where, the, where the realities related to opportunity costs come up. You know, that, that we, we now have, you know, uh, uh, limited resources, always will have limited resources, and that there's probably going to be an, an increasing disparity between the tech, what, what, the te what the technology that we now have in health can, can do and what we can afford. And I'm wondering about uh, ways in which you uh, are thinking about engaging patients and public around these questions around opportunity cost, because it's in the end public money for the most part. Um, and, you know, um, um, so I, I guess that's the question. Uh, is there, do you see, you know, some of you work with health economists, uh, ways of engaging patients and public in questions around um, health economics in particular related to opportunity costs. Michael, and then John. I was gonna say, I mean, I think, first of all, I think it's a rem remarkable that you've been asking the question, because I think, you know, a couple of years ago, it would be like, how do you involve patients at all in, in the discussion on research? And if we're now talking about how do we, you know, ask questions about opportunity costs, I think it, it, it suggests that we're already kind of moving down the, the path of, of engaging patients or public, uh, the public effectively. I think from my point of view, what we're trying to do is to create an infrastructure where we have the information and the evidence available so that we can even ask those questions. I don't think we're yet at a, at a situation where we have a, an infrastructure where we can, can, in some kind of formal way, involve the public around an analysis of opportunity costs, where we have good evidence to show the, the costs and benefits of a particular interventions. I think what we're trying to do is create that infrastructure so that we will, in, in a few years, be able to have that sort of uh, a capacity. I, I don't think we're there yet. But I guess it, it uh, the flip side of that would be that, you know, we have, and I don't know if Julie is still here, but we have, you know, a decade and a half of just one person's experience, and Julie is one of several researchers internationally that have been experimenting with deliberative processes as a way to get citizens involved in those types of conversations. So the citizen panel process that I described it before, informed by Julie's work, and she's the, the lead advisor on this work, is an effort to say, let's take what we know from the evidence and really try to understand particular challenges in the system, what, what do we know about them, particular options of ways of moving forward, and they're going to have opportunity costs, and particular ways of rolling out that plan. And then you engage diverse groups of citizens to talk that through. And it's very different to hear the person in the Northwest Lynn with unbelievable geographical and other barriers to access sitting alongside the relatively affluent person in downtown Toronto with all kinds of advantages, to hear them collectively grapple with how do we make these trade-offs? So I think we do have a pretty rich tradition of, of research on deliberative processes where we can get citizens actively engaged in discussions about opportunity costs and hear from them about how do they feel we should be balancing the values and preferences that will drive our final choices about those trade-offs. At the end of the day, they're made by our democratically elected officials but I think we can systematically engage them in discussion and make sure their voices are heard, they're informed by evidence, and they're forced to consider opportunity costs and other things. Thank you. We've got another question. Yeah, while we are talking about who the public is, when we are talking about public engagement, we have talked, we are still figuring that out. We never heard about pediatric population. Are we going to engage them? And how are we going to engage them? At what age we think? is appropriate to engage children in their care, in their management, their input. Sooner we do, better it is. They say you 
put the seed at a younger age. It, they can grow better with it. We would really like to see some input from your brains. How do you see the pediatric population being involved, engaged in public engagement or citizen engagement? Thank you. That's a very good question. So I guess I'll look at Martin. Yeah, no, so the, yeah, excellent question. In fact, I was just talking to Simon just at the break about uh, how this is done in the UK, looking at, at lessons learned there. I mean, children are obviously always involved in, in research, either from the point of view of consent. When we're talking about participants now as consenting to research or assenting to research, depending, depending on the age. And of course, the family is always is always consented. But the, um, the, the, the exact question of, of how to engage them in, uh, in, in as, uh, as engaged people within uh, helping research design, we don't have particular models right now that we're, that we're using. And this is, these are the steps that we're moving towards. Um, but I do think it's critical. I think we, there are lots of models out there. There are youth forum, uh, you know, a very, and, and of course, in pediatrics, it's not just one age we're looking at, right? The different ages have, have completely different needs as far as their need to, for, for being autonomous from, from parents and other decision makers and a, and a younger group where they tend to be more involved with their parents in decision making. So we have to, uh, we have to work through these, through these complexities. And I would say that we are, we are at the beginning of doing that. And there's a lot of work to be done in that. And, uh, but as to the previous person who was at the mic saying, you know, make sure that you do it and make sure that when you do do it, that everyone doesn't recreate the wheel, base it on models that are already done out there, and then make sure that it's rolled out throughout, uh, throughout the province once it's done. So I, I think it's critical, and I think, I think we have work to be done there. So maybe the question that I that I'd like to ask is the you know the research uh, enterprise and industry you know is pretty set in its way and I guess coming up with more applied research and patient engage and patient engagement and oriented and outcome research is a little bit you know something new so we're all recognizing that we're starting a little bit of a journey so the elephant in the room is probably you know what's happening with basic research and is this you know going to displace basic research or do you see you know any ways that patient engagement would actually inform some basic research and how that would contribute to uh, to that so i'm interested to have your thoughts on that martin so uh, no I, I certainly don't think that this displaces discovery research in fact uh, you know, discovery research is important in, in the pipeline of, of um, developing new therapies, new approaches to, to come down to the bedside. So it's, it's, still, it's obviously still a critical part of the, of the research enterprise. Um, you know, there is debate, of course, of if, if, if funding is now going in towards this area, is it being at the expense of another area of research? And that's, uh, we would all like to grow the envelope of funding, and if there's a message that we can bring back to our, to our government, is, is it possible to, to grow the envelope of, uh, of funding for, for research in, in general? Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a choice that I would not like to make that we take money from discovery research and put it towards the patient-oriented side. Having said that, um, what we are creating here and with patients as being advisors and patients being um, involved in, uh, in um, implementation of, and, and um, knowledge translation of research is that what we are creating is going to help eventually the discoveries that come from the discovery research side. So it is easier to do clinical trials. It's easier to do comparative research once these um, once these products or, or devices or decision rules are ready for implementation. So I, I would just add, I mean, I think, um, number one, I, I don't, I agree with Martin, I don't think there's a, a, a risk per se to displacing discovery research. Um, I think that there's no doubt that discovery research could also benefit in many ways from patient engagement. And, and you know, I, I'm not a, that's not my area of expertise. I'm not sure to what extent that's happening now. But, but I, I would say, you know, it's in all of our interests that we actually grow the envelope of dollars that are going towards research uh, in Canada. And I think if you look at what's going on in the States, some of the huge investments that have been made around patient-oriented research in the U.S. under the Affordable Care Act, what's going on in the U.K., massive investments uh, as well. 
Canada risks falling behind. And I think this effort at engaging the public very deliberately uh, as partners in research is actually potentially going to help make the argument uh, for why this is important to do and, and the potential benefits for the public, for our health system and, and its sustainability, um, uh, and, and, and why it's important to support research more, more uh, generously than we have been in the last couple of years. I guess what it made me think of is, I guess, one thing that I'd hope is that it doesn't lead the folks who are engaged in discovery research to even more kind of overhype their findings. I mean, we see, you know, you, you open the Globe and Mail, you turn on CBC, and there's all of this stuff coming out that isn't ready for application right now. And if the incentives are even more that they're going to oversell it, that would be unfortunate. I think there's, you know, a, a relatively manageable flow of actionable, high-quality evidence that applies to individuals at any given moment in time. And we're now getting much better at reducing that noise-to-signal ratio and making it accessible in language that people understand so they can pull that in and it would be so un unfortunate if these are the focus on more applied patient-centered research is put in in competition and then the, the discovery oriented folks feel that they need to engage in even more hyping because I think that just creates huge amounts of noise in the system and what we need to be doing is putting usable actionable high quality evidence in people's hands so they can use it in ways that they see fit to inform decision making about their own care to inform decision making in their practice to inform decision making about how we need to reform the system Good. So I guess what, what, what we've heard now from even from patient is the uh, uh, some of the thing about sustainability, avoiding duplication, uh, making sure you know that there's synergies in terms of the efforts of all of those centers of excellence and I think this is where OSU is a little bit innovative in terms of building and creating that platform uh, where we actually can come up with that synergy and and, and using and building on our strong foundations and uh, leveraging you know, the assets that's been there. We could have gone away where we actually decided to redo it all over and reduplicate what we had. We've you know, decided to actually work on uh, consolidating you know, the excellence and the force that are in play uh, to actually uh, change the culture. And this is a transformational journey and it is a, you know, a path where we'll be going and exploring for, for the next, uh, for the next uh, years to come and see. So I would like to thank our panelists for their insight and their uh, clear uh, discussion and uh, particularly in their collaboration and their openness in terms of you know, that new direction and that new path that uh, we are all selecting and seeing value into. So please give a good round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>